So I promise I'll keep it very short in a very basic language so everybody can understand um, basic concepts and I will ensure I will leave some time for questions. So feel free to ask any question, raise your hand. This session is being recorded, but don't hesitate yourself to ask any questions or interrupt me. Uh, this is supposed to be a dialogue here. We're in a closed forum, uh, and that should be it. So the title, AI and Half-Life Algorithmic. What does that mean? That's not rocket science. I promise you, it's something very simple that surrounds ourselves, and that's part of our day-to-day -day life. So it all started with the leadership that Microsoft had taken, and most of our IT company here in the area have taken in terms of um, IT and in particular intelligence and computers and the new regulations are being needed in order to control the new environment, in order to put rules and responsibilities, how the society should be adopting that. That book that I'm referring to that is also part of the handout, if you want to look for that reference, it's, it's that book called The Future Computer AI and Its Role in Society. That book and the efforts that we have taken at Microsoft in leading a little bit the regulation that has to take place and all the changes that we have to make as a society to responsibly use and regulate and control the technology. That book and those efforts led to a lot of interest from a lot of people. And so, uh, as a preparation for a meeting that's gonna happen on February 26th and 28th, which is a few days from now, where there's gonna be a participation from Microsoft and IBM, where the Archbishop Paglia and the delegation, including uh, the professor Father Paolo Benati, and Father Carlo, and Monsignor Lucio Ruiz, and Secretary of um, the Secretary of Communications of the Vatican, Father Andre Siuchu. Uh, we met with them September 5th, 2019, and that was a preparation for the meeting they're gonna happen in a few days. So, if you wonder a few of the concepts that I just said, whatever the capture is, you can search in your handout, that's the second um, question there. It's pretty much you know, a department a delegation for the Vatican, that was uh, in charge of leading this effort uh, in driving education on technology and industrial artificial intelligence. So that was a picture of the meeting uh, at Microsoft. And two things that I want to pull out they were, um, they were the two main takeaways. The first one is, uh, all these smart people that live there, and, and all these, yeah, and I'm, I'm including the first row and the second row, the delegation from the Vatican, and several people who were interested in the area. Uh, all of them led to two things uh, that for me was the biggest takeaway. The first one was that all this complexity that people are still getting their hands around, they're trying to understand how to embrace how to use it our benefits uh, needs some regulation and all the forum and all the attendees that they were there they were asking the delegation of the Vatican you leaders of the church tell us Microsoft what should we doing what's the guidance that you can give us how we should be designing our products how we should be using how we should be regulating so we are aligned to the commands of the church to the guidance of the church, to the guidance of the Catholics. And the short answer was something that really blew my mind. It was, first, the problem is not ours to solve, or for us. Uh, Archbishop said, uh, Archbishop Pagno said to us, it's not for us or up to us to solve it, it's for the church to solve it. And we are all church, we're all part of the church. I mean, it's like you, us, we have to solve this together. And the second thing is that who better than you, he told us, that is really leading all the research and leading all this um, trend is more upfront, first row and center, 
to pretty much participate in solving these issues, in solving these challenges. How do we address technology? And how do we regulate and control and provide the guidance? To me, that was like, uh, it was a call out. It was a great conversation. All this complexity was just down to, let's get together and let's all solve it. And I was like, how I can solve such a big problem? And, and then, in the end, it was very easy. Everybody plays a role here, and that's gonna be part of my, my presentation. Second takeaway was that something that was done 2,000 or more years ago uh, still valid as it was 2,000 years ago and still valid today. And what I mean by that is that when we're looking for guidance or, or we're discussing very specific challenges to solve with technology and how they're being solved, we were going back to the Bible. <laughs> and, and I was surprised. I was not sent to something like a new document that was published. No, we were going back to the very, very first same principle that we were all raised in our Catholic, which is love your brother as you love yourself. That's it. So we're all in this one world. 2,000 years ago, there was no internet. There was no cell phone. People from one continent, they were not even in, in contact with another continent. And that Bible was pretty much calling us to behave as one big house, one big world, one set of rules. Everything that you do in one corner of the world, it'll affect somebody on the other side. That's pretty much what technology is doing. So that was my second takeaway, that um, in doubt, go to the very first North Star, our core principles, our rules, the word of the Lord. So I just want to share with you that story and that, uh, and I wanted to move into my presentation some of the concepts uh, to land and give you proof how is that in our today's life, in our role as humans, as part of this society, as Catholic. I'm gonna break my presentation into three main topics. The first one is a few concepts and some fundamentals that I would like to land. Uh, the, um, some of the fundamentals is the language of computer in a very simple way, what's artificial intelligence, um, and then after that one, I will move into um, some, I will say, example of our day-to-day -day life, and always looking from the three perspectives. Us as a users, us as designers who are making the technology, and us as a role in regulating how technology is used. And you will be surprised that some of you don't think that you play a role in these three areas, and we do. And lastly, I'm gonna leave you with some thoughts for reflection. I don't come here to tell you or command you to do something. I don't have any bias. I'm a very um, believer that technology can help, but also with technology comes responsibility. And I wanted to share with you uh, some of those thoughts. So you might think that artificial intelligence is something in the future, rocket science, or look like the robots that I was having in my last page. Turns out that artificial intelligence is everywhere. It's right here, it's surrounding us, and it's not in the future. You can find examples in our day to day. You can find examples in health. You can find examples in your car, in your cell phone, when you press your application yourself when you wanted to navigate from one point to another one. That's artificial intelligence. When you want to set up your thermostat to learn how to control the temperature of your house, all the research that's been done in agriculture, in health, with genomics and all these great inventions. And it's even in very simple things, even from your fridge, that in the past it was just to keep your food cold to avoid spoiling it uh, very quickly. Now your fridge turns into even more things. Now it doesn't only keep your food or your meals cold, but also tells you if you're taking more calories that you should, or maybe if you're missing milk and you, then you have to go to the supermarket or the grocery store to buy milk. It informs the kind of your kids. It can quickly display news, etc. 
So you can see multiple examples when you go to the grocery store, you can scan it quickly, you don't have to talk to a teller to pay that. If you go to Home Depot, if you go to Amazon Go, there are multiple examples everywhere. So that's not a rocket sign, it is right now in your hands. Think about that when you wake up this morning, how long it took you from the time that you woke up to check your emails, to check your news, what device you went to. It's pretty much you know, in our day to day. So computer devices, all those things, how do they work? Very simple. We tell the device what to do. We, you, we tell them what to do. And the way that we tell them what to do is that word that's called algorithm. That's the language of computers. And you can see also in the handout, a very simple definition of that one. It says, an algorithm is just a process of rules. It's a command. When you have something as an input, as a data, you do something. That's pretty much what we tell them. And you can see in this diagram how an algorithm can work. If an event happens, then what the computer should be doing. If the temperature of my house is 60 degrees, then the thermostat should be kicking the furnace and the furnace should be elevating my temperature of the car or the house or whatever that is. If I'm late for a meeting and the alarm says, hey, you should be attending this meeting. So if an event happens and the data happens, then the machine should be doing something. And by machine, I mean a device, my cell phone, the car, the TV, the coffee machine, anything. All that is to achieve a goal, an objective. We have technology not just for the sake of having something automated, it's to achieve something. The challenge is, what happens when we don't have the data or the input that we need, which is that big box number one, yes, or when the action taken with that little input is not the, the result that we expect. Because again, who is writing that code? It's us, you, humans imperfection, and then we expect a result that is perfect. So, just to bring in awareness. So, who can tell me that sign on their box number three is about? That scale, that balance. It represents justice, right? It represents fairness. So, when you are making an action, that's when the ethics takes place. That's why uh, this um, father, who's a Franciscan, who was with the Franciscan attire in the picture, he came up with that term that I loved it. And he said, you, we, we have to come up with algorithms. He said, what's that? Just a combination of how we write the language of computers with ethics. And again, also in my handout, I define or share with you if you want to check what the definition of ethics and how is that different from moral values or how is that different from legal. You can do something that is legal, is moral, maybe it's not ethic. Or today, with the changes, you might be something that is ethical, moral, and is not legal, and vice versa. So these three concepts change. Technology is changing the world, and therefore we have to update and change the rules. The rules that govern this world. One thing that keeps contents is the word of the Lord, is the Bible. So very interesting how we have to change technology, we change technology to resolve new challenges and more complex solutions. We have to change the rules to accommodate that. So before, or 10 years ago, we didn't have to have rules of how cars can drive with no driver. 20 years ago, we didn't have to have rules how my data has to be shared in the internet or who can treat my data. So just some food for thought. So what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence, again, and also another definition on your handout in here. Artificial intelligence it's not just a machine or a robot. It's just how computers, how devices, how my cell phone, how will they perform some activities and how they display 
those activities, and in particular, cognitive services, functions that are related to cognitive services. And what, what's that word of cognition or cognitive services? In a very simple terms, you can relate to a cognitive function as something that is related to activities of the mind. So now we're talking about how we see, how we speak, how we problem solve. Those are activities very unique to humans. And then how we can have a machine acting like a human or a device acting like a human. So we have seen computers or devices every time closing the gap between what a human does and what a machine does. Before it was like you had to press keys to write a letter and if you make mistakes, you had to do it again, wrinkle that paper, throw it away and start from scratch, line one. Today, a machine can understand what you're writing, can self-correct and propose correction of what you're writing. Just last night, I was exchanging an email with Sultan, and Sultan was asking me, hey, how are you, mind if I record this session? And I quickly, was in a rush, typed it with my foot finger on my cell phone, and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it. But the word fine had four letters, and I mistyped fine. And my, my cell phone understood what I was trying to say, and then translated, converted the word fine, which was misspelled, to done. Same word, same four letters, completely different meaning. So, so then I'm saying, Hori, I'm not sure what you wrote to me, but you're saying, I'm done with filming. So like, do you want me to film? Is that okay? <laughs> like, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. That was just a typo. But again, my cell phone was trying to understand what I was trying to say and correct me. I didn't have to shrink a piece of paper, start a letter again, etc. Just a very minor example how it's done on a day today. Artificial intelligence is not new. A mathematician, an English doctor, long time ago, Alan Turing, in 1950, only with 30 years old, he posed a question, very interesting question. Can a machine think? And by machine, a device. By that time, they didn't envision cell phones, you know, smart cell phones. There was no internet. What year do you think internet came up? Any guess? 1971 was internet invented. The concept. Somebody said, hey, let's connect one computer with another one and let's have them talking externally, not in my own environment externally. And I can have in, you know, computers connected. I have a few days here to explain what the internet is. So this guy from 1950 already envisioned that the computer is going to be advanced and with the algorithm and the language, we're going to get to a point that we have to be careful. Computers might be thinking. And that was 1950. A lot has happened since then. And we have achieved human parity. What's human parity? What's parity? Well, that word, it's just equal. You, you can replace that with equal, superior, or the same. So now a machine can be the same as a human, can achieve uh, a level of precision, accuracy, performance, definition, speed, very comparable to humans. Actually, in the last four years, five years, a computer can even recognize better than a human something. Like if I show you something round, it can be a ball, it can be the rim of my car, it can be a tire, it can be an apple. What if I show you just a piece of that tire? Maybe then that's the human start challenging. Is that a piece of the tire? I don't know. But a computer can recognize that compared to multiple images and with the new developments. That speed of comparison can be way more than the human can do, more than the mind can do, and therefore can come up with more accuracy. Same thing with speech, same thing with language understanding. When you even write a letter or you, uh, or you talk to someone, that person can interpret that in a different way. Now computers are even able to understand that better than someone else. 
So, as you can see, this is not the future. This is some of the past, and it will be continue going, and it will be a, a very steep curve. And for that one, we have to adjust. That means that we have to have responsibility. So technology put us in a position from the three roles that we have to play, as a user, as a designer, as a maker of that technology, and also as the entity that regulates that technology. And each of us has responsibility as citizens, as part of this society, as regulators, as a dad, as an uncle, as a brother, as a parishioner, as a father, as a leader in a community. Some of the three elements that whoever is leading this believe have to be in place. The first one is privacy. To be able to manage artificial intelligence is about managing data. Therefore, we have to be very careful how we treat data because it's not my data, it's everybody's data. So when you take a picture with your cell phone, that picture is not just an image. That picture has information about you, your house, where the picture was taken, the day of the picture, etc. That's a lot of data you're sharing. If you publish that picture in one of the social medias, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, etc., that information is gone. It's not in your hands. And now it's in the hands of millions or hundreds of millions of people. And you know, now it's forever. You cannot take that away. So priority is something very important. Who has rights to access your data? And who has rights to manipulate your data? Who has rights to share your data? So that's priority. The second one is security. So if you are allowed to measure data, then you have to ensure that your data, the way that you measure data is secure. That nobody's gonna be hacking you or stealing that data. That's the technical terminology of stealing data. Cybersecurity. It's how we protect data in internet. And lastly, one of the three pillars of that responsibility is ethics. We, we already talked about that, right? It's not only the legal or the legal aspect, it's not only the moral aspect, it's also the ethics. And even as a Catholics, we have a strong responsibility in that one. But also as a father, as a priest, as a teacher, as a leader in our community. So I'm gonna walk you quickly through three examples. And in each of those examples, keep in mind these three things. Who's a user? Who's a consumer? Who's also the designer or the maker of that technology? And who is the regulator of that technology? All right? So first example. As real as it gets right now, this is not rocket science. That's pretty much uh, an email that I sent to a customer, and a customer partly sent back to me, say, hey, I think we can arrange a meeting. Our legal team can join you from 3.30 to 4. Would you be able to adjust that time? And you can see in the bottom, uh, and this is a screenshot from my cell phone, automatically my cell phone, read, understood what the email was about, and immediately suggested some of the answers. Yeah, I can do that. That's one answer, one option. The other one is yes. The other one is yes, no problem. So my cell phone was already understanding what was the content on that email. So think about, again, the three users, maker of technology, and regulators. Another example, by the way, NLP or NLPU stands for Natural Language Process Understanding. In other words, the ability for a machine or a device or a computer to understand the context. What's the intent, what's the objective? Who is asking for what? Is there an action needed? Another example, real life, that's a screenshot from my computer. At the end of the week, my computer shows, hey, I've been reading your emails. I've been reading communications via email, via conversation that I'm recording. And there are three actions that we want to ensure that you are executing against. The first one, with my same customer partner, say, hey, you said, 
Again, this is the computer telling me. You said in one of the emails, Jorge, that you will revert back to this person with the initial draft of the contract by Friday. That means by the end of the week. Did you do that task? Just a reminder, make sure that you don't miss that. So I have a, an assistant in my office already following, hearing, accessing my information. And you can see two more examples. You said, I will ping you. Again, it's even translating some slangs. What is ping? Ping translate, yeah, I'll reach out to you, I'll give you a boss, I'll give you a nudge. But it's understanding with my informal language, I will ping you, blah, 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 and saying, did you do that task? Did you ping that person? And then last one, it's not just work, it's also an email externally from Bank of America, my financial institution, saying, that was a commercial, that was an advertising. Hey, to review this account, please visit your mobile or banking experience, etc. Did you do that task? Do you want to execute that task? As you can see here, day-to-day -day tasks. We have an assistant, a smart or intelligent device helping me. So who's the user? Whose information is being shared? Well, all my emails, all my conversations. Who's making that to work that way? And also, what are the rules and how that technology was made? Uh, so we have to be conscious the users. Well, how my data has been used. If I'm the one designing this, okay, it, my user will be okay with that. Do I allow my user to sign up or opt out if they don't want me to read your emails? All that is possible. If you don't do that, then you're breaking basic rules. Just another example. There, Melody, it's not a rocket, it's just a car that is parked here in your parking lot that you have seen every day. This is not in 2040, no, no, this has been there for several years, and it's driving. So how much do you use and how often do you use just routing from point A to point B to go from one point to avoid traffic, to avoid tolls, all that is being used in everyday uh, driving experience. And that's been taken even further, which is now cars can drive without a driver. Well, cars can assist a lot in your driving, can recognize, again, using machine vision, even reading what's going there, so now I can identify, is that a person? Is that a pedestrian? Is that a car? Is that a pedestrian or a sidewalk? Is that street one way or two ways? Do I have to stop? There's a traffic light? All that is in the car today. So again, who's the user, the driver of that, of that car, the passenger of that car who's relying on the pilot, the responsibility that we have? Not only if I design the car, what are the decisions I'm gonna tell the car in that algorithm? If you see a pedestrian crossing, what the car's gonna do? If there's an accident that you cannot avoid, how the car's gonna react? Or do I kill one person, or do I kill two? Or do I kill the driver? Those are decisions that you have to think. <clears throat> of course, we don't want to kill anybody, but uh, again, if, then, else, what? Of course, if we have an intention, if we have an objective, we want to achieve it, absolutely, no brainer. But since this is imperfection and we're using it, we have to also take into account those corner scenarios or those unexpected scenarios. Just one more, last example, face recognition. That's also machine learning vision. The machine can recognize you. And one thing that is very unique is our facial appearance. That's why when I turn on my cell phone, I don't have to press anything. My camera sees me and automatically says, by the way, I have 25 minutes remaining. And I didn't have to enter my passcode. I mean, it saw me and I can be wearing glasses where I cannot be wearing glasses. I can show just a portion of my face. But also my face can be identified in a bank, or can it be identified to receive credits or not? If I identify that you have 
Latino, racial, ethics maybe, mm. this guy behaved this way. Or if I identify your, your South Asia, you know, and I have a correlation between your face and the baggage and the trends, I can determine some certain actions. Is that right? Is that legal? Is that ethical? What God tells us, treat your brothers and your sisters the same way. You cannot go by your, your facial recognition. Is facial recognition bad? No, it helps. But it's how we use technology, right? So who's the user? What information being shared? Who's the maker of that technology? Think about that. Another example, cashierless stores. Just come here, grab, pay, and go. Go into the store, pick whatever you want, and leave. You don't talk to anybody. No social contact. You don't have to tell what you want. If you need assistance, you can get assistance without talking to anybody. <coughs> Who is the maker of the technology? The solution? Does that help? How does it benefit? Who's the user of that technology? How the data is being used. What's the responsibility? Is that great? Is that good? Yeah, absolutely. It's good. It's great. If I'm in a hurry, go in and out. What are the consequences? I remember I shared that um, with my son Alejandro, and Alejandro was once saying, like, Daddy, what's gonna happen with the poor people who was you know working at the cashier, at the teller? They're not they're gonna be out of jobs. So we have to think broadly, and we have a responsibility. Technology is right, but also we have to think about many things. So, some thoughts for reflection. Again, us thinking about these three things, users, designers, makers. I have to show you that you don't have to be a designer uh, or, or you know, working in Microsoft. Anybody here can play a role as a father, as a teacher, as a leader. And we decide how to use technology. When you're using a technology, either a cell phone, a computer, anything, or internet, you can decide and be conscious how you're sharing your data, how you're allowing others to work or manipulate your data. By the way, I wanna share something that I skipped, that I thought it was also a very good example, that you can come up with uh, some creative thinking, uh, some creative ways in a second. Yeah. So the first thought that I want to share with you is, I want, to ask, I want to have you ask yourself that question. If technology is helping us, if technology is allowing me to be more productive, why I have less time to do the things that really matter? Why I don't find myself doing what I really like, spending time with my loved ones, or doing good? Why uh, my son can do now homework without my assistant? Why? That was before an excuse for me to share with him and sit down with him. How I can replace that? How I can also enable technology, embrace technology, but at the same time continue embracing my values and behaving as Catholic, as a father, as a brother, as a friend, as a mother, as a daughter. We also talk a little bit about um, the second uh, thought that I want to leave you with is AI. Artificial intelligence, automation, technology in general, it's going to impact everyone of us. It's continuing impacting and will continue impacting many of us. And we have to think about all the side effects, the unintended consequences. So for you, young uh, professional, and you're looking for jobs, try to look for those jobs that you envision how technology is going to be working with you. If you do basic jobs that can be replaced by a computer, don't pick that one. Pick the ones that you are going to be adding value and that you can embrace computer. If you're just reading errors in the document as a clerical assistant, don't do that. Now computers can understand and identify the errors. So try to look for ways 
that you are valuable. The third thought is how far we push it, how far we take the knowledge. Just a funny slide uh, to make it a little more uh, funny, but uh, it is not just about being a robot. It's not about like me, but now I have a device, a wearable in my hand wrist where it can tell me my pulse, my heartbeat, if, I, if I'm too high in temperature, if I'm resting enough, how many hours of sleep, right here. It's not about acquiring glasses to speak or about connecting my brain to something that I can see more. When I talk about how far we push it, it's in every dimension. It's getting to a point that blurs the limit, the boundary between how humans behave and how robots behave. So we have to be careful about not stepping over. So in, in every single area, it's not just absorbing, auto, uh, but it's also how we manage the data. Are we pushing too much in sharing information? Are we pushing too much in regulating or not regulating? So we have to uh, think more on that one. And technology is everywhere in health, medicine. The other thought, the challenge is not that computers are acting almost like humans. That's not the challenge. The challenge is that humans are acting more like robots. That is a challenge. By us being users and adopters, are we letting the computer to dictate what I want? Am I letting myself be controlled by a computer? But there were a very creative way to avoid that. Here are some teenagers and kids having lunch. The restaurant in Australia was offering a discount. If you put your cell phone in a cage, the restaurant offers you a 10% discount. You can see the dad or the parents happy. <laughs> the kids are not so happy, but uh, that's how we force a relationship. How often do you go to a restaurant and you see a date and they're not even talking to each other, they're looking at their cell phones. And we can find ways. And same thing, if you're having a family, having dinner, put your cell phones away. Find those times. Again, cell phones are great. Computers are great. Video games are great. Can be the occasional distraction. Can be entertaining. But how far we push the limits? One final thought is that uh, again, I'm in pro technology. So long it's being used for good. You can use a microwave to cook meal, but also you can use a microwave to create a bomb and to destroy and to harm people. The same instrument. You can have a knife to operate and proceed a surgery, or you can have a knife to kill someone. Same thing as technology. The impact of artificial intelligence in our society is viewed as both a blessing and a curse. Let's use the technology for the good. Again, these are some thoughts, uh, the summary that I wanted to leave you with, and uh, some time for reflection. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Father Chad, Sultan, and everybody who made this possible, and of course, you know, those also who gave me the blessing and the experience to be uh, exposed to what the Vatican and the delegation of the Vatican is dictating and asking us. And also just a reflection as parishioners, as an entity in the society. So for that, thank you so much for listening and for your time. Appreciate it. And I'll be here also for questions. Uh, if you want to have any questions, there's a mic. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, discuss. I'll be here also after this. Please speak your questions in the mic.
Um, but everything is done in your own house. How do you use, how do you let people use your data? But of course, there are many movements, forums, meetings. Actually, the 26th to the 29th of February, there's going to be a meeting hosted by Microsoft, IBM, and some leaders in the industry where the Vatican is going to meet. And pretty much that they're trying to influence and bring awareness of how this area of artificial intelligence is developed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, great question. So, uh, the question was asked about you know, religions and, and the diversity, not just this is not a movement or, or something from the Catholics, it spans across all the religions. And actually, that meeting that we had with the Vatican, there were some Catholics in that meeting, but there were other completely different views, uh, and it was very interesting because. One thing is that uh, technology does, technology doesn't look at like what your religion is and, and what your beliefs are, or what your moral aspects are, or what your ethics are. Technology looks at uh, a humans equally, and the challenge that we're having a driver, if you're Catholic, or a pedestrian, is Muslim, or, you know, it's gonna act independently on that one. That's why we all have responsibilities. But we have to come together because technology is being used in a different way and in ways that we have to ensure we can use it responsibly. So thank you for the question. Yes, there are many movements uh, and we're trying to come together. Not because this is coming from the Vatican, it's Catholic. It's, it's a group of people representing multiple areas, uh, multiple religions, multiple trends, because it's affecting us all of us. So thanks for the question. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. I think it's part ethical question, maybe it's a legal question. If I am a designer of a device or software that I intend to uh, be used in a useful way, but then uh, by mistake that device causes harm, uh, do you think the designer should be responsible for, for that harm or what happens when somebody uses the device? Uh, aware of that, and they have some responsibility when dealing with devices. Great, great question, thank you. Um, so, the question was about, you know, what's the responsibility pretty much for the designer? That's how I interpret it, right? Uh, so, we can summarize what's today's responsibility and how people who are designing and making technology are acting in a responsible way or not. And I can tell you that. Um, as we go into new territory, new arenas, this is new for everybody, um, we are driving awareness to ensure that that happens. But many people are not conscious, and we are even discovering some of the unintended consequences. So we have seen cars killing people, and then who's responsible? Do we get the car in the jail? No, a car is not a person. You know, how we can take a car, a vehicle, or a computer to jail because something happened that we're not expecting. But then the designer of the vehicle has some responsibility. But more importantly, we have to understand that technology is something that is imperfect because it was made by a human. Therefore, we cannot blame the car if the car acted in a different way or weird way. We also have to take control of how we use technology. The most important message here is how we use technology and how we let a machine, a car, a device, a robot do the things. And how do we supervise and ensure that's being used in the right way? That's the most important message. But of course, you know, we're driving awareness of the manufacturers. Um, there was a robot in a car manufacturer who killed a person. So who's responsible, the robot or the person who was operating that technology or the manufacturer of that technology? I think we all have responsibility. Again, as a user, as a manufacturer, designer, and as a ruler or regulator. Well, thank you so much for
comments. And I wanted to reiterate what you said, which is pretty much ultimately, I always tell my kids and my family, situation happens, things happen, just because that situation was enabled to happen. If we don't enable that to happen, then nothing happens. So how do we avoid that to happen? Anything is being conscious how we share data, how we share our data. Be conscious when I take a picture, am I sharing my location? Be, be conscious of when you use technology of how you're making that technology or that data, your personal information public, if you let people to react or not to that one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, apparently it's very tight and close, but I'll follow you, uh, with you on that one to see exactly who can attend, whether it's going to be recorded or watched, or can you uh, participate or not. I'll take that uh, action to follow up on that one. Yeah, thank you. Microsoft, but many other also uh, software vendor cloud providers or technology vendors, we are putting a lot of effort in our training and readiness. Very specific to Microsoft, uh, whoever is managing data, manipulating data, or building data that involve the privacy of a user, cloud, etc., or any of those areas, we have to go through an approval process. There's a committee internally who regulates, you know, if, I'm in, if the software that I'm writing is in accordance to First, the law, and second, the ethics and the culture of my company. Because maybe even if something is illegal, my company is not going to be allowing me to get into the area. So how I manage data, whatever, like there's a questionnaire, there's a quality assurance process that is in place to ensure that I don't get myself into trouble or I don't get the company into trouble. I can react to that question. I think uh, that question is, uh, demands a very long conversation and we can have multiple ways. But I can tell you that um, 
long time ago, or maybe not too many years ago, I, I, I was using a roaster. And by the way, this roaster was given by a person and their close friend, thank you. Uh, beautiful, and it gave me the strength to convey what I experienced. Uh, and, and I was using this. But of course, you know, if you use that and you're driving, you know, like it's a little bit challenged. Now, unfortunately, I use this. And now the roster tells me, you know, exactly what mystery it is. You know, it counts on how many mysteries. It can even hear my voice, yes. Or it knows when I'm pausing and I'm not praying. So it pauses with me. So it's a companion to pray. So those type of things are silly, assistant, safe, fine. But then you can tell and try to imagine once that boundary start crossing over where you say like, no, that's not, you know, now I'm, I'm behaving as a robot and maybe I'm not praying. Now, now I'm being addressed or I'm being manipulated by a device. So you can tell, and that could be funeral service, could be anything. So we have to have our space and there's a point that we have to say no more. But it's up to us to put the food as consumers and designers. And again, ensure that the situation doesn't enable that to happen. Thank you, Sultan. Well, thank you so much for having time for tonight with us. Uh, thank you. If you'd like to stick around to ask some more questions, please feel free to.